Welcome back to our ongoing series of videos on loads on buildings. We're in chapter 2, section 2, subsection 5, and we're dealing with static wind loads. And in this particular video, we're going to present an example of calculating W equals PS on floor edges. So you can think of a building as being cantilevered up out of the ground, um, and the loads on the walls get delivered subsequently to the floor edges and then the diaphragm floors deliver that load to other parts of the building um, most specifically the lateral wind bracing system so the first thing we have to do is calculate the the loads on the walls and then figure out how much those walls transfer to the floor diaphragms so here we have a building in section here's the wind direction so this is the windward face, and we're trying to calculate how much load gets delivered to that and then subsequently into the floor diaphragms. And we haven't shown any cross bracing, but this might be a rigid frame structure, or it might be um, uh, some sort of cross brace structure. But at the moment, we're just trying to calculate the load on the floor edges due to the wind. So you can almost imagine conceptually taking the structure and rotating at 90 degrees and then it would be a cantilevered beam <clears throat> under gravity load but in our case it's a cantilevered beam coming out of the ground that's subjected to wind load so the building is 60 feet tall uh, and it's a four-story building and the floor-to-floor -floor dimension is in every case 15 feet now what makes a building like this <clears throat> more complicated than say a gravity load analysis is in a gravity load analysis we'll have a, probably a uniform deck here so the dead load is uniform everywhere um, also the live load will typically be uniform or at least uniform over large areas in the case of the wall though we have a variable wind pressure and we have to make some decisions about how we're going to handle that so in this case we're going to assume, assume an exposure B, a 100 mile per hour wind speed uh, as the design wind speed that's incident on the flat roof building of height 60 feet. So we've mentioned already it's four stories, the floor to floor spacing is 15 feet. And uh, we worked out previously the wind pressures but we're going to run through that again really quickly. We did that on this example in the last video. but. Uh, we're going to repeat it here because of the importance of it, but also just so within this video we'll have a complete set of information that you need to carry the process through from beginning to end. So our goal is going to be to calculate the wind load W in pounds per foot on the edge of each floor. And then in addition to that, we're going to assume that the joist spacing uh, for the joist supporting the roof uh, decking is six feet on center and we're going to calculate the wind suction load W in pounds per foot on the roof joist. Um, that will not be a constant over the entire roof just like the edge force uh, for the floors will not be constant because the design pressure varies over the area of the roof. So this is a repeat but I'm going to run through it really fast. And exposure B, 100 mile per hour wind speed, is incident on the building. Um, because the building is more than 30 feet high, the variation in pressure that occurs above the 30 feet must be taken into account. And we're going to do that by using the height and exposure adjustment factor. And we're going to simplify it because that factor is variable from 30 feet up to 60 feet. Um, we're going to use the height and exposure adjustment factor for 60 feet for all elevations above 30 feet. In other words, between 30 feet and 60 feet, we're going to use the adjustment factor for 60 feet. That's just to simplify the arithmetic. And when we, when we plot the diagram, you will see how uh, inconsequential the difference is. We're on the slightly conservative side, but not so much that we're being wasteful. All right, so from the uh, height and adjustment factor table, we said for exposure B up to heights of 30 feet, the adjustment factor is 1, so we can read data straight out of the tables. 
So the pressure on the windward wall from 0 to 30 feet is our adjustment factor of 1.00 times the pressure out of the table, which is 15.9 pounds per square foot. Um, on the other hand, from 30 to 60 feet, we're going to use the adjustment factor for 60 feet, which when we look that up is 1.22. So between a height of 30 feet and 60 feet, the uh, design pressure on the windward wall will be taken to be 1.22, which is the adjustment factor, times the basic uh, wind pressure that we read out of the tables, which is 15.9 pounds per square foot. So we get 19.4. For the uh, windward side of the flat roof, we have a wind suction that's minus 19.1 pounds per square foot. If we had a 30 foot high building, but we have a 60 foot high building, so we need this adjustment factor of 1.22. So the upward suction on the windward side of this flat roof is going to be 23.3 pounds per square foot, the minus sign signifying that it's suction. On the leeward side, uh, or the leeward half of the roof, we still have the same adjustment factor, but we had a lower wind suction on that side. It was 10.8. So when we multiply in the adjustment factor, we get 13.2 pounds per square foot with a minus sign signifying suction. So we have this diagram. Um, for the lower portion of this wall, we have the 15.9 pounds per square foot. For the upper portion we have the overpressure of 19.4 pounds per square foot. These are both overpressures so they're positive. Then on the roof on the windward side we have a suction of minus 23.3 pounds per square foot and on the leeward half of the roof we have a suction of 13.2 pounds per square foot with a minus sign to indicate that it's suction. So the minus sign means that suction and the arrows that are drawn here are indicative of the directions of the forces that are involved. All right, now that we have wind pressure data, we can move on. We can use that information in the formula W equals PS to calculate the line distributed forces on the various parts of the structure. So we have this wind distribution on this structure. So this diagram is showing us the location of the floors and um, the basic uh, geometry of the structure. This is showing us a plot of the wind pressures. So we could take these and put them directly on top of this building. <clears throat> now let me make a few comments on this wall. We may have some sort of wall that spans from floor to floor. It could be a concrete masonry or some sort of steel, light gauge steel, or it could be glass. But whatever the case, we'll have, like, for example, um, mullions for the glazing system would span from floor edge to floor edge. So we could analyze what W is on each of those mullions, and we would have to do that, in fact, to size the mullions, unless, of course, we can simplify all that by having tables from the manufacturer that say you can span such and such a distance under such and such a wind force with this prefabricated system that we want to sell you. So you may or may not get into the details of analyzing uh, the mullions in that wall, but somebody has to analyze it. It either has to be data that comes to you from the manufacturer, or you have to analyze it, or your engineer has to. For the moment though, we're going to consider that a cladding issue, and since we're primarily involved uh, in the uh, behavior of the overall uh, framing system and what we call the primary wind-resisting system, we're going to assume that the mullions along this wall are close enough together that the loads on the edges of the floor slabs are essentially uniformly distributed. So we're going to completely bypass the whole analysis of these um, mullions and assume that we end up with a uniform load along the edge of this floor. So here we have um, a table that uh, breaks down all of this. We're calculating W along the floor and roof edges. 
Here we have wind pressures, uh, spacings, W's, and W totals. So let's start with the roof edge. The roof edge supports the upper half of this wall. So there's 15 feet between that floor and the roof edge and the upper half of that is being supported by the roof edge. So when we come along here we say the spacing for that is 7.5 feet because the roof edge is only backing up half of that wall at the top. And it has no wall above that it would have to worry about unless of course we had a parapet up there which would uh, be a burden that gets added to the roof edge. But right now we've drawn it as no parapet so we can we can make this 7.5 feet. And the wind pressure is 19.4 because that's what it is on the upper half from 30 feet to 60 feet up on that wall. So we have a wind pressure of 19.4 and it's positive uh, because it's, it's uh, basically an overpressure. So 19.4 times 7.5 is 45.5 pounds per foot as the load W along that edge of the roof. And then we say W total and that's everything because in fact there is no force from any wall above because there is no wall above. So we come along here and then we say well what about the third elevated floor slab? So that's this floor slab right here. It's actually supporting halfway to the roof edge and halfway down to the next floor edge. So we're going to treat those as two separate cases and we're going to tabulate it. So we have from the upper, from the wall above, we have a wind pressure of 19.4 and a vertical dimension or a width of 7.5 and we multiply those together and we get this. And then for the upper half of the wall below, we have the same numbers. It's the same wind pressure in the same uh, width of wall that's uh, being backed up by that floor edge. So we multiply those together, we get 145.5, and then we add these two contributions together, this being the contribution from half the wall above, that being the contribution from half the wall below, and when we add those up, we get 291 pounds per foot. Now when we go look at the second elevated floor, life gets a little more complicated. We have half of this wall above and half of the wall below contributing to the load on that floor edge, but we don't have a completely consistent situation because the wind pressure varies. We're accounting for 19.4 pounds per square foot above and only 15.9 pounds per square foot below. So when we go to our table, we basically say that we have um, 19.4 pounds per square foot above times 7.5 feet is the width of wall being supported above by the edge of this floor. So we get the same number here. When we multiply those two together, we get the same number here that we got above. But for the wall below, it's 15.9 pounds per square foot times 7.5 feet uh, as the width of floor, or the width of wall being supported. So that comes out to 119.3. And when we add these two numbers together, we get this number, which is lower than that one because this number is lower than that one. In other words, we've gone through a transition where we're now accounting for portions of the wall where the design wind pressure is lower. And by the way, I want to emphasize that this is not the true form of the distribution. The real distribution would come down and down and do something like this. But for simplicity, we approximate the curved pressure distribution uh, with these two blocks. So I want you to understand that abrupt transition is not a real physical phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that comes from the assumptions that we made. And once we make those assumptions, we have to grind the numbers mathematically uh, in to be consistent with that. So when we arrive at this point, we have this apparently abrupt transition between 145.5 
in 119.3, which is not physical reality. It has to do with approximations that we've made in terms of how we're going to account for variations in the wind pressure. Now we go down to the first elevated floor slab edge. And so we go back up here and we'll say that's this one right here. And for this one we have a half a width of wall above and a half a width of wall below. And we have this lower pressure throughout that entire zone. So when we come here we say it's 15.9 there and 15.9 there. And in both cases of course it's seven and a half feet of wall that's, that's attributed that's being handled by this floor edge seven and a half feet above and seven and a half feet below. So we have this 119.3 and 119.3 and we add them together and we get 2.38. Now we come down to the foundation. It's only supporting seven and a half feet because it only has to support wind load up to that point. So we only have this one con contribution from the wall above, which is 15.9 times 7.5 and we get 119.3 and since they're not two components the total will just be that 119.3 if we wanted to depict this graphically with some kind of scale on the arrows such as 0 0.005 inches uh, per pound per foot uh, this would be the length of the arrows that we would draw it to uh, one thing I want to emphasize here is whenever you're trying to keep track of stuff, it's really smart not to try to do it in your head. So when I started this problem, I did what most people do. I was lazy and tried to run all these numbers in my head and realized that I really needed to organize this in some systematic way, partly to avoid mistakes but partly because in the long run it's actually easier that if you're systematic about it you break it down into little uh, bite-sized mathematical chunks and so as you look at this spreadsheet I know this looks complicated but if you try to do all this in your head to come up with these numbers uh, you'd be a lot worse off so I encourage you to use spreadsheets not only to do your computations but help you keep information organized in a way so that when you're dealing with complex problems they become simple problems because you break it down into a bunch of little parts each of which is clearly articulated and clearly presented in some kind of organized structure. Alright, so these are uh, handwritten data. These arrows are drawn to the length. We got 146 pounds per foot on this edge so if we drew this in three dimensions, we'd see this uniformly distributed force all along that edge of 146 pounds per foot. Um, and I didn't draw what's it down at the foundation here. I'm not quite sure why I didn't do that. Now, if we went up on the roof, um, we can do the same W equals PS, except the spacing on the roof is six feet. So let's go look at that. Here we have the wind suction on the windward half of the roof, which we said was 23.3 pounds per square foot. We were told originally the spacing of the roof joist was six feet. So we multiply P times S and we get W. This is a suction, so it has a minus sign. This is also a suction force or an upward force. So it has a minus sign. On the leeward side of the roof, we had a lower suction but we multiply that times S and we get W. So if the joists went all the way across the roof, we would analyze them to have this load on the half of the roof that's uh, on the windward side and this load on the other side or the leeward side. Um, and then again, we can apply a scaling factor and get arrows if we want to. And so that's where this plot comes from. So if I go back, we're getting about 140 pounds there and about 79 or 80 there. So for some reason I rounded this to 140, but I didn't round that down. Um, but these are the loads that we have to account for. Uh, in this case, we're told that it looks like we've got a joist here, a different joist there, a different joist there. 
So over this joist, we'd have this pressure uniformly from one end to the other. Over this joist, we'd have that wind suction uniformly over its length. And then for this little beam between these two columns, we'd have the higher load on one side and the lower load on the other side. And what might often happen is the engineer will pick this larger value and assuming that beam is still really light, which it almost certainly will be because it's not spanning very far, then basically just go with the larger of these two values. Okay, so that ends our example calculating WPS on floor edges due to the static force of wind loads.